How's it going, everybody? This is going to be the beginning of the end as far as our evolution chapters go. Um, chapter 25 deals with some, some, some miscellaneous items. Um, the origin of life on Earth uh, is, is, I'd say, the, ma the meat and potatoes of this, this chapter. So we're going to discuss that probably over two videos. It could be just one longer one, but you know me, I like to break them up. So I'll probably split it up into two. And let's get to it. And share my screen. All right, so here we go. We'll take a look at the history of life on Earth. Um, there's there, there's a good bit in this chapter that you won't necessarily need to to memorize or remember. Um, I think it is a good idea to certainly read through and understand sort of the progression uh, that we think life has taken on this planet. But I'll try to highlight what I think are the more important parts to remember. And again, this is lightning fast reviews since, you know, you, you did all this work over the last, geez, I guess it's been like six weeks, maybe. Something like that. Anyhow. So let's see what we got. Uh, all right, so macro evolutionary changes. So we're talking significant major changes in, in life forms on planet Earth. Well, certainly the invasion of vertebrates onto land transformed things quite a bit. Um, photosynthesis, just being able to make your own food using sunlight was huge. Uh, and also mass extinctions. There's been five, and we'll briefly discuss a little bit about that soon. Um, but yeah, we're a major, major percentage of all species on Earth uh, went extinct. So then, well, we'll get to that. I don't want to get ahead. Um, this is sort of the formation of life on Earth in a, in a nutshell, as far as the steps that we think occurred. So, you know, you, you probably heard the phrase at one point, maybe not the primordial soup, you know, how, how the water once, once earth cooled and, and liquid water uh, was on earth in the oceans, you know, you had this, these, these massive bodies of water with inorganic chemicals in them. And that was like the soup, you know, like you have the liquid basis of soup and then all the vegetables and maybe some little meatballs or something. But yeah, so the primordial soup had inorganic chemicals in it. And so here the abiotic synthesis of small organic molecules. So we know organic molecules have to contain carbon uh, and hydrogen, they're hydrocarbons. Uh, and they give rise to larger organic molecule polymers like proteins and carbohydrates, nucleic acids. But at first we needed the creation of organic molecules from inorganic molecules and abiotic meaning without the help of a living thing doing it. So eventually those small organic molecules formed the macro molecules, the polymers, like I mentioned, proteins, carbs, uh, nucleic acids, lipids. Packaging of these molecules into protobionts. So these are almost literally pre-living things. So imagine lipid bubbles small, tiny lipid bubbles that sort of kind of resembled cells. If you think about it, what a cell is, uh, it's a bag of chemicals surrounded by a lipid membrane. And so we'll, I'll show you an image in a, in a bit. These protobionts formed where basically organic molecules were trapped inside, um, reacting, sort of uh, mimicking an early metabolism. Um, and then once self replicating molecules formed, and, and we're talking RNA and eventually DNA. At that point, we could say that these were living cells and not just little lipid bubbles of chemicals. Um, the self-replicating molecules allowed for heredity, allowed for reproduction where the offspring cells, you know, resembled or were identical to uh, the parent cell. And once that happened, then we can officially say that 
that life began. It's difficult to define a living thing. You know, the, the characteristics of living things, it, it is somewhat complicated. Um, but at that point, we would say, yes, these qualify uh, as living things, at least under our current definitions of that. So Earth, we think about 4.6 billion years old. Uh, and we think that because the oldest rocks we've ever found date back to 4.6 billion years ago. Um, you might remember this from first year bio. We think early Earth's atmosphere lacked oxygen gas. Ooh, excuse me, head rush. <laughs> um, but did contain things like nitrogen and carbon dioxide, methane, ammonia, um, hydrogen gas, water vapor. Um, and again, it's not that oxygen is an element that exists, but you know, O2 diatomic oxygen gas molecules were not in the atmosphere, certainly not like they are today. So this, these were the components we think of early Earth's atmosphere. And a pretty famous experiment done by Miller and Yuri um, basically wanted to see how organic molecules could have potentially formed from inorganic ingredients. And so, again, you might remember this from first year bio, we had a boiling water chamber, right, to put water vapor up into this pseudo atmosphere, which contained things like ammonia, methane, hydrogen, water vapor, uh, the ingredients of, of what we think were present in the early Earth's atmosphere. The electric sparks, um, Scientists, these scientists thought, well, how, what could be the activation energy, the, uh, the, the energy to power the conversion of inorganic molecules into organic ones? They said, well, there was a lot of lightning in the atmosphere. So maybe these electrical discharges provided that activation energy. And so they zapped these chemicals. They had a cooling condenser. And basically, let's see what we made. And it turns out that they were able to make simple amino acids this way. So from inorganic ingredients, we were able to, they were able to uh, make organic molecules. Now this doesn't prove anything. In fact, the jury's still out on how the first organic molecules formed. Uh, it very likely could have been down in hydrothermal vents, down deep in, in the ocean. Um, so it's unclear, but at least the reason this is such a famous experiment is it shows that this is at least a possible explanation or how organic molecules formed. Okay, so in the fact that amino acids have been found in meteorites, um, some people claim it's contamination. Some people uh, believe in a extraterrestrial origin of life. Now, not that aliens, you know, that, that were some alien experiment, but rather that organic molecules or maybe even the first cells were, were seeded here on Earth and that, and that they developed and that they develop somewhere else in the universe. Um, that's, again, a different story. Not a lot of evidence for that, but it is out there. So we mentioned these protobionts, these pseudo cells, you, you could say, um, little membrane bound droplets, lysosomes, or lysosomes, <laughs> liposomes. Um, and, you know, if you've ever shaken up some salad dressing, you know, oil and vinegar, you see how the oil kind of forms those little spherical droplets spontaneously. And so we're talking about these little lipid bubbles, which undoubtedly could have trapped some molecules inside. Um, they could have had certain chemical reactions occurring inside because the molecules are more concentrated. Uh, and this would represent sort of a simple metabolism. So again, we're thinking that there, it was a progression toward little lipid droplets uh, that resembled cells, started acting like cells, and once self-replicating hereditary material, either RNA or DNA, formed, and now we got some living cells. And we think RNA was first, by the way. Um, RNA can do everything DNA can do. It can uh, act as a template for its own reproduction. Uh, it can encode uh, information. Uh, it can be passed on from parent cell to offspring. But it can do one thing that DNA can't do, and that's act like an enzyme and speed up certain chemical reactions. So ribozymes is the term for RNA molecules that act like enzymes. Uh, and for that reason, we think RNA was first. 
Now, why did DNA take over as the genetic material? Again, nobody knows for sure. Uh, maybe the fact that it was that DNA is double stranded uh, and the bases are in the interior of the twisted ladder. Maybe that allowed for a more stable molecule. Maybe it was uh, it protected the code a little bit better than than RNA molecules. Uh, we don't know, but obviously, eventually, DNA did take over as the genetic material. All right, self-replicating, catalytic RNA, okay, more effective at using resources, and then sort of a natural selection took place for protobionts that used RNA in these ways, you know, per perpetuated and, and lived on and, and continued, and the ones that didn't, you know, got eaten and metabolized. So we base a lot of our evidence for how life has changed on fossils, fossil evidence. And um, it, it's crazy to think what a super tiny fraction of, of living things are represented in the fossil record. Um, and it also blows my mind how many things have lived and died and gone extinct on this planet that we will never have any clue existed. Um, I can't even imagine some of the things, I mean, when we've, just dinosaurs, just that's it. Just dinosaurs. How about that? You know, those things actually did live and run around, and it's, you know, just Jurassic Park. It's it's insane. Um, but you know, soft-bodied organisms aren't going to fossilize. Even hard-bodied organisms, the conditions have to be just right, um, and finding them isn't easy. It's not like we're digging every you know square meter on the planet looking. So. Um, it's, it's some organisms can't fossilize. Um, it's very difficult for anything to fossilize and then just finding them is, is an issue. But remember earlier I said earth was 4.6 billion years old. Well, we think that because of this process known as radiometric dating. So in nature, in the, in the world, uh, in the universe, really, there are isotopes of different elements, which are, they have the same number of protons, but a different number of neutrons than the normal number. So that's an isotope. And some isotopes are unstable, right? The nucleus is a little crowded with those extra neutrons. Uh, and so those, those unstable isotopes are called radioisotopes. Uh, and they do tend to go through a radioactive decay process. And there's different types of radioactive decay, but a combination of particles and energy are released uh, and these elements, these isotopes can change into other elements because they can actually spit out protons. And we'll remember that the number of protons determines the identity of the element. So basically these radio isotopes decay into other things at a certain predictable rate um, known as its half-life. And it's the time that it takes. A half-life is the time that it takes for half of a radioactive sample to decay into its daughter isotopes or decay products. So here's the weird thing about it, though. Let's say we have a rock that, that formed and it trapped a certain amount of radioisotope in it at, the, at its beginning when that rock first formed. Well, after a certain period of time known as its half-life, which could be from seconds to millions of years and any, anywhere in between, half of that original isotope will have decayed into some decay product. But the weird thing is, and let's say that's a million years for this example isotope. The weird thing is after the next half-life, after the next million years, half of the half will decay. So there's a quarter of the original amount left. And then after the next million years, the next half-life, half of that will decay. So there's an eighth of the original amount left and so on and so forth. So it's really bizarre that in, you know, in some cases, some of these isotopes will decay immediately and some not for millions of years. But they do tend, we think, to follow this pattern of decay. So again, using, uh, an isotope with a half-life of a million years. Let's say we find a rock, we analyze it for how much of that isotope is in it, plus how much decay product is in it. 
And let's say we discover that there is one fourth isotope and three quarters of the decay product. Well, if there's one fourth of the original isotope left, one half life, there'd be half left. After the second half life, there'd be a quarter left. And so if we know the half life of the isotope is a million years, two half lives have gone by, that rock is two million years old. So I'll probably give you guys a, a, another uh, little Ed puzzle or something to explain this in, in more detail. But that's the gist of how we radiometrically date things. We use carbon dating. You may have seen shows where we'll use um, isotopes of carbon, carbon-14, to date things that are more recent. Um, I think the half-life of carbon-14 is in the neighborhood of 5,000 years. Um, but for rocks that maybe are as old as the Earth, we look at isotopes, uh, I want to say lithium might be 1.3 billion years. Might have a half-life of 1.3 billion years. So it depends on, you know, if you have a guess as to how old the object is, you're going to maybe look for and analyze different radioisotopes. All right, let's see. All right, I think I'm going to go ahead and stop it here. We're about 16 and a half minutes in. Um, let me go back to this. Yeah, I think this is probably a decent spot to stop, and then I'm going to summarize the rest in the next video. So let me know if you have any questions, and I will see you soon.